So now that we have continued to develop the notion of proof in predicate logic and have developed more tools that we can use in our proofs, we're now going to look at section 6.4 and use an alternate method of equ equational proof in order to help us um, prove theorems in predicate logic using these new tools that we have established. So first let's recall what our equational style proof method looks like. So originally the way we have used it is by establishing equivalences between well-formed formula and the Hilbert style version of the equational proof is where we have equivalences at each step and we translate that into our equational style proof where we begin with any well-formed formula and establish a series of equivalences from one level to the next and explaining why each one is equivalent to, to the next and getting essentially by applying transitivity of equivalence that a1 is equivalent to a n plus 1. And we had a number of different ways to apply equational style proof to prove different theorems. But as you may notice in the new tools that we have added to help us to proof theorems in predicate logic, right, by removing and inserting the universal quantifier and the different forms of substitution that we are going to use, um, some of these results are relative theorems. And we already know that we can't use any relative theorems in an equational style proof because they don't establish an equivalence, right? They require hypotheses, and the hypothesis implies something else. So we want to actually adjust our equational style proof to allow for those implications or to use those relative theorems. So now we're going to introduce a new type of equational proof, or add on to our equational proof, by allowing implications in our steps of our Hilbert proof and then using this one unidirectional arrow in place of a biconditional arrow whenever we know that one well-formed formula implies another. Now, why is this really that powerful? So how can we use the relative theorems? So we recall by the deduction theorem, a relative theorem like A1 proves A2 becomes an absolute theorem in terms of A1 implies A2. Right? So that means that in this particular step, if A1 is a hypothesis of, an, of a relative theorem, with A1 we can use a one-directional arrow to conclude A2. So for example, knowing that A and B is A, for example, if we use split, if we have A and B, we can use this directional arrow to give us simply a if we, we need to, and we would use the relative theorem as our annotation here. So this now allows us to use relative theorems within our equational style proof. And what is happening now? So now we have to be a little bit careful because now we're only establishing an implication and through the transitivity of the implication operator, we will establish that a1 implies a n plus one where we can use these equivalences because if a1 implies a2, for example, and a2 is equivalent to a3, then through substitution, if a2 is equivalent to a3, and we know that a1 implies a2, then we also know that a1 implies a3. So that allows us to continue to move through to get to a n plus 1, using also the fact that the implication arrow is transitive as well. Okay, so let's now look at a particular quick example of how to apply this new proof layout. So let's prove for all x, a implies b, implies a implies for all x, b, provided x does not occur free in a. So this only holds, so we can only distribute this quantifier through and drop it in front of the a if x does not occur free in a. So that's what we are going to prove. So because we want to prove an implication, we can use an equational style proof with the implication. So we begin with the left-hand side for all x, a implies b. 
Remember, we have an axiom that tells, that, that tells us that we can distribute that quantifier throughout. So axiom AX3 tells us that for all x a implies b implies for all x a implies for all x b. So this helps us to get somewhere. And now we need to know why we can drop this quantifier. Well, knowing that x does not occur free in a means actually that for all x a is actually equivalent to a. So we're going to use strong labneys to replace for all x a with a. We have to justify why these are equivalent. So I claim that since x does not occur free in a, ax4 tells us a implies for all x a. Right? At the same time, we know for all x a implies a, this is simply just specialization. So by ping pong arguments, since we know both directions, a implies for all x a and for all x a implies a, using the ping pong argument, we know that they are equivalent. So that means we can, whoops, that means we can substitute one for the other. So our c part is p implies for all x b, where p is fresh. And here, p doesn't occur in the scope of a quantifier, so the conditional substitution works, and we can use strong labneys here. So this is just an example where now we know that this implies this by following through that implication.